We're going to have an open conversation today. It's going to be a bit different. You know, we'd like to end with a very interactive workshop session. So we're going to have someone here, Amber, that she will have the microphone. It's very important that you grab the microphone if you have any question, so that the people that are connected online can hear your question or your comments and your vision on the case. Okay? And I would like you to introduce maybe yourself and the company before you actually ask the question. I think we can start, uh, and then, yes, yeah, some more people will join us. So this afternoon, for this case study, we're going to discuss about um, sustainability in general, right? And we have to do so. Two amazing persons here on stage you will uh, get to know them. <laughs> so we start with, actually, a, a case studies with PAC and the transition through sustainability, thanks to Deloitte Services. So we've got Cecilia Dalacqua, who is a senior manager at Deloitte for sustainability and ESG. Uh, and James Lovett, who is a general manager uh, UK for PAC. I leave it to you guys. Introduce yourself, maybe role in the company and what you're doing, and then it's all ours because we're going to discuss all together. Me first? Perfect. So it's very nice to be here today. Um, I'm actually a senior manager in sustainability, as Damien was saying. I have been working with sustainability for already 10 years. And it's funny because now it's a very trendy topic, but in the beginning it was almost nobody was talking about this, right? So I really live by the purpose of Deloitte, of making an impact that matters. And with PAC, we are going to be able to do this through their sustainability and ESG practices. So really excited to explain it to you today. James? Thanks, Cecilia. So I'm James, GM of the UK for PAC. Uh, we were founded in Spain about five years ago. That's still our parent market. And we're headquartered in Barcelona. But in the UK, we've been able to really turbocharge our sustainability model. Um, I'm really excited to be telling you more about that today. Um, the sustainability sort of model that we're adopting primarily in the UK and driving forwards there is just one component of a far broader ESG strategy, where of course environment is just one pillar of that. Um, so really excited to be talking about the collaboration between Deloitte and PAC today and how we're hoping to very transparently influence nudges of the industry uh, in the right direction for our planet as well as our customers. Exactly. So let's start by talking a little bit more on what are the pillars. Today we are going to go through where we, where we started, where was the seed of the thought. So understanding really the global challenge and how can PAC um, impact on them and really propose solution for all of them. Then we are going to go through with the sustainability commitments and then finally deep diving a little bit more on the environmental and how PAC is creating value or managing its impact on the planet. So how did PAC started this, this strategy on sustainability and how they start building up the concerns was um, analyzing what was the global challenge that we have. So each one of the agents of the value chain must implement and really understand where are their role and where they can really create PAC um, impact. So they started by looking around and understanding the global challenge. So for example, the climate emergency crisis, the micromobility boom, all the innovations that can bring to life um, through their activities, collaboration opportunities. So this is so important that to really create an impact is not um, only doing uh, the activities by themselves, but really trying to look at the sector, um, bringing all the agents together and implementing common solutions. This was a looking around, but they also started asking around. So what, what the stakeholders was expecting PAC to really move forward. So we interview more than, I think, 50 stakeholders from internal and external as well. And what would they ask for PAC was in two dimensions, one in the environmental and the second in the social. Okay, what they were asking, first, green deliveries, okay? Um, what about the solutions that they were making available for them to green solutions? Um, what is green delivery, right? So trying to narrow it down where they can create impact. Also, one of the major things that um, most stakeholders was asking was about transparency and data collecting. So how can PAC really promote this, um, really 
understanding on what is the impact of this delivery and helping them to reduce. The accountability, so it's not only about reporting, but it's also making um, initiatives to create impact. So the accountability of PAC on, over this, and also how can they compensate all the negative impacts that they are creating. They also talk about social concerns, so also health and safety on the value chain, how can they invest in the communities in which are um, they promoting the activities, and also a very important aspect of ethic and compliance as well, that is a big trend on the sector. Based on these, um, we start reflecting inside, and we look as well on the global framework. So we went to the Sustainable Development Goals and saw what is the role of PAC on contributing to this global challenge. So um, we identify from the 17 that they can act, act in, in a direct way in four main goals. The nine, big, um, industry innovation and infrastructure through promoting innovative technologies on the delivery system. Um, in the 11, in sustainable cities, also through the monitoring and improving the quality of air, all of the cities of the last mile mainly. Of course, the third thing on climate action, so calculating um, the carbon footprint and acting on a carbon net zero um, strategy. And finally, the 17, that from our side, I think is one of the main SDGs that should be taken into account in the companies. You can, as I was saying before, you cannot make a great impact if you don't collaborate. So PAC is looking um, around and building alliances with clients, with customers, with fleet, with other agents to really promote uh, a global um, solution. Once we have the, this goal on contribution, they establish um, a commitment. So they establish four main verticals or dimensions in which they commit to make a, an impact. Okay, the first one is planet, so PAC is committed to lead green deliveries to mitigate our environment impact and promote sector transformation. And in this they have um, five North Stars goals in which they are going to act, and they are related to environmental, environmental commitments, managing emissions, use of natural resources, and promoting circular economy. The second dimension is people. So they are looking to all the people around the value chain and they are committed to the welfare and empowerment of these people. Um, and they have North Stars in four dimensions as well, so promoting a solid culture in the company. So PAC is quite a, a young company and they really want to build a sustainable culture um, across all the, the new employees. Also employment practice and health and safety, as we know this is a, such a significant aspect and mostly after all that we have lived the last year, so they are really um, defining goals under these aspects. And finally, diversity and inclusion, that is also a big topic in which logistics and supply chain can really act upon it. The fourth pillar is society, so it's looking around, is committed to inclusive progress, no, leaving no one behind. So how can PEC promote the change, contribute to the society um, through volunteer to commu community involvement in all the cities in which they are. And finally, this is the transversal one, is responsible business. So really um, be as responsible as possible and promoting this open dialogue with all the stakeholders through a responsible business practice. So ethical and conduct compliance, so they have a really strong culture and structure to comply with all regulations. They have built a open dialogue with all the stakeholders to receive um, their, their main concerns and act upon it. They also work constantly with partners and fleets to manage what are their expectations and how can they promote change together. And finally, building partnership with one of the most um, 
impact retailers that they have, and James are going to, is going to explain a little bit um, after it. So this is the sustainability commitments that PAC has approved, and they are acting upon it. As I said, they have North Stars for each one of these dimensions, and also they have 55 actions and initiatives in which they are going to work on the next two years to implement and promote this change, right? This accountability over sustainability practice. So if we look a little bit into inside the planet, right? And James is now going to share how is this commitment bringing to life and how are they really walking the talk? Thanks, Cecilia. So as we think about that first pillar of planet, it's obviously a very relevant one in the current time for many reasons, and we have COP26 about to start in the UK, where we hope that as humanity we align around some of these goals widespread across all industries and us as consumers and the choices that we make every day. And I think that from a UK perspective, primarily, we had an opportunity at the start of last year where, of course, PAC is you know, building from a lower base. We're not a, a big national carrier. We're able to define something better and then scale that in a way that is sustainable from, from a lower base. And in the UK, we, we had an opportunity last year when lockdown came about where we were seeing huge growth across the network. And we took that moment to accelerate a lot of our plans and sustainability. And the first step of that actually started about three years ago, when we were trying to understand the attributable value in an improvement of first attempt success. And that's where it began. And PAC is a tech business, so it's all about, you know, optimization is synonymous with sustainability and if you can use technology to drive improvements in every area of life for us all as consumers a great example of that is GPS okay and GPS has changed all of our lives and it's prevented us from making you know faultless journeys uh, and, and wasting time and energy traveling to places where we're lost and this is a highly relevant example for the transportation sector right but how can we then aim to improve first attempt success, but then attribute a value to the environment when that is achieved. And I, I found myself you know, looking at the way that PAC uh, is, is providing customer controlled time slots, right? And we've all seen the effect of that on the grocery sector and, and others, but ambient small parcel goods, it's not really moved in that direction. It tends to be more that it's a carrier dictated slot that we as consumers must conform to. It's not the scheduling that you get when ordering groceries online, often pre-purchase. So the outcome of that, among many customer benefits, is an increase of first attempt success. But when we're looking at our first attempt success at PAC being 96% plus versus the industry standard as low as 70% success rate on first attempt, what does that 26 percentage point difference actually mean? And when we all look at the transportation industry and the delivery sector, what do we understand as the carbon impact and the broader emissions impact of every single parcel that is being delivered right now? And it's seldom publicized transparently. Why? Because it is highlighting the work that we all need to do, right, to change that. But when we look at some of the research, there's some really interesting uh, stuff coming out from universities going back to 2009, actually, and Harriet Watt University in, in Scotland published as a result of 10 years' research about, you know, as you trickle down into the detail of it, 181 grams of CO2 emissions per parcel. That's a start point, right? It gives us something attributable as an impact to then base the modelling on. So we took that and we started ratifying it, working in partnership with the United Nations, uh, the FCCC, which is the parent treaty for the Paris Agreement, uh, and the Kyoto Protocol. And we're working with the United Nations on this framework. We started consulting with the Carbon Trust, who are now underway with past 2060 certification on our model. So we're constantly trying to break our model, actually, and say, if it's not 181 grams, how can we inform those metrics with more information and more data sharing throughout the industry? But really, from that measurement criteria, that just gives us step one. Step two, of course, is then reducing against that. 
all right? And improving the first attempt success is one way of doing that. Another obvious way is electric vehicles, okay? And that combination of, sorry, if I go back, that combination of measure, reduce, and contribute is nothing new. It's the United Nations framework. It's widely known. It's how they are advising governments and industries to address these issues that we have. And once we have some measurement criteria and we have some initiatives to reduce, let's start taxing ourselves on the dirty impact that we're all responsible for. And I think one of the things I hope comes out of COP26 is more carbon taxation in some way. As long as emissions are free, they will always increase. So we ourselves, ahead of governments and other organizations, creating carbon taxation for everybody, we ourselves are taking accountability for that and investing in those compensation initiatives where our reduction is not offsetting entirely. How can we take full responsibility for what remains to ensure that the outcome is at least neutral? So electric vehicles is a good example, of course, of a reduction initiative, and we operate unlike other carriers where you employ drivers. We operate more like Amazon, okay? Amazon Logistics in terms of a network approach. And across all of our partnerships, across the multiple countries and cities that we operate, there are two fundamental drivers in how we are prioritizing volume. Those of you familiar with the Amazon model and the ATROP system and the algorithms determining how that volume is allocated, simple for us as well. Service performance is number one, of course, but number two is sustainability. What are the emissions of those partners? And how can we create more of a network impact of change by creating fear of missing out? So we've driven that initiative forward with our own branded electric vehicles as well. And if these other organizations aren't going out and making sure that we've got as many of the pre-orders of electric vehicles that are, you know, uh, now <laughs> quite a backlog from all manufacturers, how can we make sure that there's multiple partners as well as ourselves maximizing the electric vehicles into the network? And now across the UK, we have about 120 electric vehicles, vans and motorbikes operating in London, Manchester, Birmingham, and Liverpool. In London, it's about half of our network. So half of our deliveries in London are by fully electric last mile. We then have the other half, of course, with traditional vehicles, but we're able to measure all of the impact of that, ratify it, share it with the other institutional organizations, and then invest in the compensation initiatives whilst we aim to get to 100% eventually. In Manchester, Liverpool, and Birmingham, we're already 100% electric last mile. And that's how we continue to keep it. So some of the modeling that we have looks like this, and we're transparent with all of our clients that we work with, as well as broadly in the industry, and what we're trying to do, of course, is not promote pack in this. We're trying to promote industry-wide change. And if the 181 grams is something that takes flight, then let's all feed into that. Define it more, continuously improve it, learn more as a collective industry. Um, but these are the kinds of metrics that we're reporting on. Um, and enabling us to achieve carbon neutral today and take us much further as we move forwards. A polynomial uh, example of the same modeling that's happening. And of course, we're certifying all of the compensation initiatives that we work with, example being One Tree Planted on reforestation around the world, an organization, if you're not familiar with them, that work with Google, Facebook, other major industry players on these kinds of reforestation projects for responsible reforestation. And this is where we're aiming, that of course carbon neutral is not good enough if the world continues to warm at 1.5 degrees per year, that the difference between that and net zero is of course the plans that enable us to improve beyond the impact that is happening everywhere. So we're aiming for fully certified by in fact the foremost certification of net zero, which is past 2060. ISO, still about three years away. So how can we not have businesses marking their own homework on this critical stuff? How can we involve these organizations and ensure that there's certification that comes out of it? And how can we be building towards net zero, not just neutrality, and be doing so as a collective industry? So hopefully that paints a bit of a picture. 
And over to you, Damien. I'm sure we have questions and so forth. Thanks, uh, James and uh, Cecilia. Can I have the mic again, please, Alex, so that everyone can hear me? Hello, hello. Yeah, no, no, well, that's fine. My microphone, Alex, please, is not working. Anyway, um, yeah, thanks. I think the most in interesting thing here is maybe to share with you guys if you're working as a retailer or as a vendor. But um, before that, I've got a question that pops up quite a lot of time, which is what about the customer expectation, right? It's always kind of an argument that we have in front of, okay, being kind of sustainable or very in involved in this uh, solution. And then mm -hmm. we've got in front of that an argument that says customers want to have the product fast, right, and cheap. Okay, that's the very first broad question. How do you react to that? What would be your first insight as a business, but also as an advisor? Hmm. I'll go first on the first of them, right? So, it's really interesting when you talk about consumer demand because I think that's evolved a lot in the last year. And I think that a year ago, speed was number one. I think the immediacy need of consumer has evolved more into convenience. It's not necessarily about wanting the product now, it's wanting the product when it's convenient for you, which may not be now. It may not be within two hours. It may be at a certain time tonight or a certain time tomorrow in the coming days. So I think scheduled delivery is becoming you know, really, really critical as a consumer offering. Um, but yeah, with convenience, of course, sustainability has really risen up the ranks of consumer demand in the last year as we've all seen the impact of when humanity stops. And that's all the kind of thing that we want to maintain now and not go back to how it was and how can we build it better. So from, from our perspective, the consumer demand is more around customer convenience and around sustainability than even speed. But of course, a next day, a same day service, for us, that's pretty standard anyway. So we feel like the speed thing is already being taken care of by the nature of how we're, we, we operate. Um, now it's about focusing on convenience and sustainability as the two most drivers. But I would say as a caveat to that, that if one is reacting to consumer demand, you're already too late and that the key is to predict where it's going, right? And as disruptive technology businesses, we're always trying to change the status quo, skate to the puck. These are all expressions from big tech businesses that have changed our lives. Um, and so it's not always about responding to consumer demand today, but being able to predict where it's going. And I think convenience and sustainability will continue to dominate. Yeah. And I think to complement, I don't know if, ah, okay, great. Um, to complement to this, um, consumers, when they are taking the decisions according to sustainability, one thing is the gap between the knowledge to be able to support this decision making. So one of the things that we are talking here is the transparency, right? And being able to help the consumer to take into account the sustainability during the, the, the decision making. So if you provide with the data, if you provide with the information, I believe that consumers will be able to t make a, a more sustainable decision on, over which type of packaging. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask a bit uh, the audience now, um, have some of your feedback. Who amongst you are already implementing sustainability actions in the delivery or in processes? And can you share a bit about uh, your vision on sustainability in your business? Uh, if you would like to, that would be great. Additional, also, yeah, go ahead. So we'll give you the microphone. Please tell your name and your company and maybe the country you operate because the regulation is also very important in that framework. Yes, gladly. I'm Louis uh, from Suplus. We do uh, pet supplies across Europe, purely e-commerce player. Okay. And what we're seeing in terms of sustainability, we have started recently properly addressing it. We have now and then projects that had been running for a while, but now we're putting them all together. And what we're seeing with uh, consumers is that Still, in the industry, there's sustainability talks everywhere and everywhere it talks about sustainability and everything has the word somewhere. But with consumers, we're seeing two groups. One of them don't care yet, or they don't give us any actions that we can measure where they care. And the other, let's say 30% that care about it, they're evolving into that before they cared about sustainability and they were willing to put money into it or actions into it, waiting an extra day or something like this. 
And now, interestingly, this group is evolving to where people are getting more knowledgeable and some of them are starting to challenge our own initiatives. Mm -hmm. And when we're say we're, and I say this just randomly, but it, I think, aligns with the name. When we're saying we're planting a tree in the Amazons, a tree in the Amazons, some of them are challenging it and our customer care people are starting to get these questions. Where is this tree? Why is it a tree and not a mm -hmm. mangler? And, so even this 30%, let's say as a number that is interested in it, is becoming much more critical of what we're doing. So even what we're doing, which is not enough yet, needs to be also qualitatively speaking more detail for these people. And I had a question. Um, <laughs> so in the case of your, your uh, customers, when they see it, the, 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 last, the last one receiving the package, do they have choice as to whether they receive it through a green delivery or not? And do they have visibility when they receive it, whether it was green delivery or not? Thanks for all of that. And great questions, Lewis. Really appreciate it. Um, I'll go. I'll answer the last one first, which is yes. We we give visibility to our clients, to the wider industry, and of course to the consumers, and we, um, you know, help make sure they're aware of the electric vehicle that's delivered it to them and the benefits of, of what they've experienced. But then to go to the first question. We're not charging anything more for this stuff, right? And we're not, you know, there are clients that will sometimes differentiate between us and perhaps a standard carrier, and of course, publicize and market the benefits of PAC versus that alternative. But we're not separating our network. Okay, for us, this is the new standard. This is not about charging more for a sustainable approach, it's actually about paying less for the non sustainable. Yeah, and it comes back to the carbon taxation and taxing the dirty to incentivize the clean. And I think that's what needs to happen across all industries and consumer groups. Um, so yeah, we're not separating the service types, we're not providing a green option versus another option, but of course our retailers and, and our clients are able to leverage our service alongside another, and the outcomes are obvious, that you know, consumers will always choose the sustainable option, especially if it doesn't cost more. Um, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Lule. I work for Photobox. So we produce photo, photo products and gifts. And it's really nice to see that a car is so committed to uh, sustainability, which is a key thing uh, now. Um, and I have a question about you have a target of a CEO to uh, to be CEO by 2030. Um, and we hear a lot of carriers talking about the final mile, being sustainable on that side, but what about the first and middle miles? What are your plans for that and to be sustainable? Thank you. Another great question, thank you. I'll take this one. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, at the moment, we're a carbon neutral last mile network in the UK. So it means that all of the measurement criteria that I described earlier is based on the last mile distribution. But of course, that's not all of the impact, right? And we have a mixture of collecting vehicles, but also clients who are injecting to us. And that in order to continue building our critical mass and growing, but in a way that maintains our model, we have to be quite selective about the clients that we work with and make sure that there's alignment in, in our ESG approach. Um, so at the moment, we are measuring our line haul when we're collecting it. We're hoping for manufacturers, as Renault announced yesterday, their, their new HGV vehicle with battery capacity and capability of 250 miles, and those, those larger long range and heavy, heavy goods vehicles are starting to come through now. But of course, they're not as widely available as the, the smaller vehicles for the last mile. So we are held back by some of the technology limitations there to optimize. But at the very least, what we can do is measure it and compensate for it and include it in all of our modeling. And that's how we now aim to go from just a carbon neutral last mile to a fully net zero CO2E, so all emissions, end to end. So absolutely everything, including our DCs, where of course we're already using renewable only energy in those DCs. But even when you have a fully electric line haul, you have a fully renewable source DC and a fully electric last mile, there is still an impact to measure. And there always will be something to compensate for. 
So you're absolutely right. We're a last mile carbon neutral right now, um, but this kind of modeling requires every single aspect of our impact to be measured, reduced, and compensated for. But uh, yeah, and I think it's a very good point because uh, we have to move on step by step, right? And we've got the capacity to work on part of the operation, part of the supply chain globally, but without any global framework or regulation that are really, you know, binding to, then we cannot uh, adapt. And it's easier to do last mile delivery than to change, for example, inbound logistics or international freight, step by step. But then it goes also back to the question of uh, maybe the agility that I also wanted to ask. We most of the time have the argument, which is small companies, they've got the agility, maybe not the money. Big corporation, sometimes it's different, right? <laughs> Big corporation have the money uh, and maybe less agility. I think we've got different sizes of enterprises here. What would be, and this is maybe a common question, what would be uh, the main blocker for companies that really want to get into sustainability? Would that be financial issues, regulation, or a bit of support maybe? What would be your uh, thought about that? Maybe we start with you guys and the audience I've, after. I've talked a lot. Do you want me to? <laughs> yeah, because you see a lot of different clients too, Cecilia, so yeah. <laughs> okay, <we> go. <laughs> great. So what we have seen is um, a little bit of confusion as well, okay? Um, when we talk about sustainability, as we were talking before, um, there are a lot of aspects that the companies may face and that they won't act upon it. So the first thing to really create impact and to do this transformation shift is to focus, so to really understand where they can make a really uh, big impact. So that's why we started here with the Global Challenge. Where can each of one of the, your companies really understand where you stand on sustainability and when, where you can really create an impact, okay? So this is the first thing, focus. The second thing is, is so hard to make a transformational shift if you are alone. So look for allies, allies inside the company. So there, this is against my 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 business, but I don't believe in a sustainability department. I think it should be a sustainability company. Each of the the directions and operations and business units must be accountable and understand what are their impact and work upon it to in line with the focus of the company. And also outside, so look for the sector, right? Where are the alliances that you can build along the value chain and with your peers to really move through lobby, through regulation, or to even innovation to really create an impact. And the third aspect, I think, to really be able to implement sustainability is what PAC is talking about, is start measuring where you stand. You cannot move forward if you don't know where you are. So what uh, we were talking before, but how dirty are you, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's bad, but where you stand, look at the things that you must work on it and don't be afraid to ask as to your stakeholders, how can you work together? Is in planet, is in emissions, is in welfare, is in health and safety. So really um, open the doors to this open dialogue and to building common strategies between everybody. Okay, interesting. Yes, uh, can we have the microphone number, please? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fernando from Teca, Spain. You mentioned something interesting for me that uh, if you not charge the increasing of uh, carbon, we are not reduce. Mm -hmm. And you work in, a, in, a, in an environment that the government incentives this control, like in France, for example. In other countries, we have different regulations, like in Spain. Do you believe that is more government-driven? Or if it's that, it's a more a pressure to the customers? Or do you see that we can move to a more sustainable delivery by the, let's say, uh, a general decision? It's more, maybe philosophical question, but it's interesting to take, so, your, take your comment. Absolutely, you. it's a great question. And I think, you know, we're seeing Madrid now starting to implement what we've seen London pioneer in the ULES zone. So that's one example of where there are similar government-driven taxation, actually, on the dirty, which is then, we hope, helping to fuel the cleaner technologies that are coming through, right? 
But we shouldn't leave it up to governments to tell us what to do. And I think that these initiatives require a bottom-up approach to how we can all, firstly, as consumers, make better choices, and then as businesses make better choices, influencing an industry, and we hope that the governments are doing the same from the top down, but I'm not gonna wait for them, right? Uh, so it, it's very interesting about those inflection points of where you get those, those models and those initiatives driven from government down, but how can we start to drive that from the bottom up as well? Um, so it's a bit of both, I think. Yeah. yeah. And if I can add, um, I would add a reputation. So there is a part of a regulation, but we really think that companies must step forward and start managing the reputational risk of being a dirty business. So before the regulation comes, they mm -hmm. need to stand up. And although we were talking about before, right, customers still doesn't include sustainability or includes like 30% only in their decision making, but they really work on um, bad statements on social media and they really attack companies that are really dirty. So managing the reputation and risk is also a strong driver when talking about sustainability. Yeah, yes. Oh, we had, okay, so maybe the ladies first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Amber. Marina from uh, Vinted, but it's more personal, I would say, uh, uh, thought. We, uh, as a, let's say, a carrier company, we are all measuring, I would say, the C2 uh, emission. But in fact, uh, uh, can my, my question is that can a company be really sustainable and have this zero two emission where uh, this product maybe was sourced in Africa because we are all challenging on cost. And do we really measure the real, I would say, impact because we source in Africa, these raw materials can be transported and produced in China. Mm -hmm. And after that, it will be sold or we sell it in throughout Europe. And I would like to have your view on that because uh, it's, um, it's good to talk about sustainability. It's uh, really fantastic to have some kind of uh, measurement, but uh, do we really take into account all the value chain? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, really great question. And I think, obviously, from a sort of delivery company perspective, we can only influence so much. Um, but we're trying to not only sort of share very transparently what we're doing in the hope that other you know, carriers and businesses will maybe take some of this and we can all work together to continually improve it. You know, we're very humble about all the measurement criteria and needing more data and information to make that better. But that's still just one aspect of the supply chain and you're absolutely right that everything prior to that, in terms of packaging, in terms of the number of countries and the textiles being used, these are all things that, as retailers, there needs to be measurement criteria for every aspect, okay? And that all bubbles up to transparent awareness with the consumer, where we're seeing now, you know, Amazon and even Shopify having separate shopping experiences where you can have an attributable impact of each product, where that is evidence of all of that measurement criteria bubbling up to the surface. That's just step one. <laughs> and, you know, if we can all be uh, approaching what might be an uncomfortable conversation about how dirty we are in every decision that we're making as businesses and consumers and be very open about that, then it helps us to work together on the reduction. Yeah? Um, so, yeah, delivery is only one aspect. And, and it's why, you know, Deloitte and other companies and, uh, of course, as a retail sector, we have far, far more that we, uh, we need to achieve. Thanks. We've got another question over there. Thank you for waiting. <laughs> Hi, my name is Srivats. I also work in Photobox. Um, we've just gotten to a place where we've managed to measure the emissions in our own factories and are able to do something about it. Uh, but once our products leave our factories, we have no idea um, like what the emissions are. Are you planning to release your methodology for how you measure these emissions and make them public so that we can all be held to the same standard and you know we can perhaps compare across carriers uh, so that it can come into our decision making you know when we are choosing you know partners 
uh, because we don't have a standard way to measure. Uh, so it'll be great if you can release your methodology and sort of drive acceptance of it. It's, it's great. This is, you know, it should be a catalyst for this kind of question because it's exactly what we want to encourage. We're, we're fully transparent about this. You know, give me your details and let me send you all the information about the measurement criteria that we're using um, because that's the only way that we can bring together as much knowledge and data as possible to continually improve all of this, right? If that then influences the wider delivery sector, then great. Um, but yes, it needs to be shared and we, we do that openly. So I welcome the opportunity to share it with you and talk you through it more. I think that the future anyway of the industry is, uh, I remember being at different events two, three years ago and the main words were collaboration and collective intelligence. And all of a sudden COVID crisis happened and then we realized what it really means. So yeah, I agree. Do we have a last comment, question, feedback? And then uh, we're gonna be, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Can you touch really quickly on the other aspects of ESG other than carbon neutral? Good one, yeah, thank you. Great question. So yeah, we've sort of deep dive on the environment pillar, right? Um, but the second one is people. And from there we move beyond just our value chain in terms of how we're caring for people to then the wider the community and then all of our social governance and how we're, how we're bringing all of that together. So Cecilia, do you wanna lead on some of those? Um, <laughs> I think there are, mm, hello? Yeah, okay. Um, it's critical for PAC and to all companies look inside, as I was saying. So PAC is um, starting to build on their culture on ESG. So the first thing is creating a governance model in which, as I was saying, everybody is accountable. Um, and they have two main pillars in, in people. One is their own personal, so health and safety practices, but also the training and the knowledge sharing on good practice on driving for the fleets and how they promote as, as well health and safety along the value chain. So this is a, a great aspect. Um, one of the aspects that is critical, mainly because as well the governance model on the company is compliance, as I was saying before. So they are building all a, com a compliance model in which um, ethics and integrity is critical. So this is also one of the aspects that we have seen in the last years, right, on how can you ensure that everybody is acting upon the values and being in really Integ um, have the integrity to promote all this impact. So I think this is, um, it began with the um, Dieselgate, right? With Volkswagen, with all the integrity that everybody is accountable. So now we promote this as well as in the company. So for, uh, for PAC, this is part is also very important. And finally, in responsible business, I don't know if you want to talk about circular economy and the uh, relationship because yeah. um, there is an, for planet, PAC is not only acting upon emissions. So they are working collaboration with their main retailers to help build solutions for their problems as well. As you know, there are retailers that are moving forward a more circular model. So how can they collect the used material and really um, be innovative in new solutions? So James, if you wanna go in a little bit more detail of this. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we're obviously doing everything we can to improve the first attempt success, right? Even in the best, you know, the utopia of having an electric vehicle and its first attempt and it's successful, what if there's things that could be utilized as a reverse logistics operation, which is helping to reduce landfill? You know, I'm not talking about returns, even though we're looking at scheduled returns to improve that experience. So we'll, we'll get to that on the roadmap later. But in the meantime, Nespresso is a great case study for this. So we're all familiar with the aluminium capsules. And why shouldn't we be collecting the used capsules when we're delivering the new, right? And just sending that to a recycling center and, and helping the consumer to have an easier way of, of, of making the right choices. So that, that's something that we do across uh, all of our Nespresso deliveries. And in fact, one in every two deliveries has a collection requested. So it's, you know, it's pretty popular. Um, with Join Life as well, which is the sustainable brand from Inditex, 
that you may be familiar with. Uh, we're collecting recycled clothing that then goes to the British Red Cross. And it doesn't have to be Join Life and Zara clothing. It can be any clothing in a bin liner, right? And we're consolidating that back at our DCs, and in that case, the British Red Cross is, is collecting from us. So these are all just some obvious ways that we can utilize the transportation that's already happening for other benefits that may not even be you know, directly commercially leverageable, but that the planet benefits, right? Um, so yeah, some, some great examples there of it. I think the only other thing I would say about people and sort of generally the, the approach that we're taking in our, our ESG strategy in those regards is um, that we're, we're trying to introduce more of a technology company to the logistics sector. And I think that you know, tech companies are synonymous with more progressive ways of operating and company culture and so forth. And this is what we're trying to introduce now uh, as, a, as a more sustainable uh, workplace for everybody. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. We can talk about that for hours and days and years. It was great having you. Thank you very much for this. Thank you.